Amen. Well, it shows now by the clock on the wall that we are live, and I uh, want to thank God for all those that are tuning in, and want to ask God to bless them and help them. I'm, I'm Brother Brandon Teague, and this is Faith Baptist Church here in Northeast Texas, and we're thankful. And somebody might say, well, why don't you tell us where you're located? Well, we're located south of Deport, Texas, down in the country, down in God's part of the world. Amen. I believe God blessed this. I know it's his whole world, but, you know, we're in Texas, so we're blessed. And uh, we're in the country, so we're even more blessed. Amen. We've got God's favor, and we ain't got all the noise of the city. But if you live in the city, God bless you, and I hope the Lord bless you today. No matter where you are, I hope the Lord reaches you with this message. However you found us, we're thankful as we now enter into, what is this, 112, part 112 this morning of a sermon series started way long time ago. And uh feels like back when Moby, Moby Dick was a minna. It seems like it's been so long ago that we started on this. But thank God it's, it's, a, it's, it's not disappointed, has it? Amen. We've not been disappointed one Sunday once we've walked with Jesus. And uh, that's what this is all about. It's about getting to know Jesus. That's the title of the series. It's been the best series, most rewarding series I think I've ever preached as far as me and my own personal growth and, and just closeness that I, that I have attained with Jesus through having done this Bible study. Uh, it's what I've been yearning for for a long, long time is a closer walk with the Lord, and I'm thankful for that this morning. And uh, we, last week we were over in John chapter 10. I want to I turn over there real quick and just kind of remind people of what we were talking about. Uh, we were in John chapter 10, and we were, I believe, verse 22, uh, down through the end of the chapter, down to verse 39. I'm not going to read all that, but I do want to read the high points. And, and Jesus said in verse 27, what we focused on last week, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Those words are so powerful, and they run so deep, and, and they mean so much to a believer because it tells us that if we, are, if we have believed on Jesus Christ, if we, have, if we have come to him as sinners, nobody can clean up and come to Jesus. Uh, listen, if you're, if you're bad sick, you don't get well before you go to the doctor. You go to the doctor sick and you get the cure or you get the medicine to make you well. And when we come to Jesus, we don't come to him trying to come with our good works to impress God and say, look, look how good a person I am, God. I deserve to go to heaven. Nobody can do that. Not the best among us. There's not a person who's ever lived on this earth who can say that. Um, nobody except for Jesus has been perfect. Has, has obeyed God in every moment. We have to be born again. We have, to, we have to be made new because we come into this world in sin. At a certain age, we realize that we're sinners. And then when we realize that, it's up to, it's up to, it's up to us to, to, uh, to believe what God has said because God has certainly uh, he sends his Holy Spirit into this world to convict and convince men of sin. He takes the word of God, convicts and convinces men of sin. The Holy Spirit takes the word of God and impresses it on the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, that they have failed God, they have sinned against an almighty God, and that they need to be born again. And when a, when a person understands that God is showing them that they are lost and they are, they're, they're undone without him, that they have no way to come to where he is because they are not perfect. There's no way they can be on their own, no matter what religion they've studied, no matter what, what uh, uh, knowledge they've gained, no matter what kind of a life they've lived. There's nothing that we can do to, to do anything about our soul. Jesus came into this world, born of a virgin, without sin, and lived a perfect spotless life and fulfilled every, every word of prophecy ever given about him. And in doing so, fulfilled everything. God sent him to be the sacrifice for man's sin. The only sacrifice 
for man's sin. And Jesus proclaimed in John fourteen six, he said, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And here we, we, we have pr- here heard him proclaim last week that if we have come to the Father by him, we are his sheep. We are his sheep. We are the people. We are the sheep of his pasture. We're his people. And he said, my sheep, they hear my voice. They, when, we, when we read the word of God, we know that this is Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God who's speaking to us. And when he speaks to our hearts, we know it. It's, it's, we know that it's to us. And he said, and, and, and I know them. He knows us. He knows who we are. He's not just he knows who we are. He knows everything about us. We are his child. He's made us new on the inside. We are not the same as we were. Something, a supernatural change has occurred when the Holy Spirit of God came into our life. He brought to life a spirit that was not there before. He's made, he's made us in the image of God. We have we have a spirit in us that communicates with God. We have a spirit in us that will live forever with God. And this outside is just a shell. But our soul and spirit will always exist. And yours will too. Listen to me, listener. If, if, if you'll either exist in a place called heaven with God forever, or it'll exist in a place called hell, or the lake of fire, rather, for all eternity in torment. And there's the only, that's the only two choices there are. So I wanted to say that on the, at the onset of this message because I want, I want people to realize where we're going with this. I want to say to the one out there listening today, and, and perhaps you've been religious, perhaps you've been a part of some religious organization your whole life, and, and, and they've promised you everything. But unless God is the one who provided salvation, there is none. And you need to hear the message today. Because I want you to understand that Jesus is calling to you, or otherwise you wouldn't even be tuned in today. God is calling to you. God has uh, there. There are no there are no coincidences that you tuned in. God has divine appointments, and today is the day of salvation. If you'll hear it, and if you'll if you'll hear His voice, and you'll believe. So let's get into it this morning. I want to turn to Luke chapter thirteen, realizing that in between in between. Uh, uh, the, these messages, um, in between these, the, the last three messages, we jumped over to John, but we're right back where we were. Amen. And um, we're going to look here in verse 22. We're going to read verses 22 and following, and we're going to read, let's see, I believe we're going to read to the end of the chapter. No, we're going to read through verse 33. Through verse 33. All right. Luke chapter 13. Verse 22 through 33, the Bible said, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? That's a good question. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in straight gates. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught us in our street. He shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. The same day there came 
certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today, and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. There, nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. And may the Lord add his blessing this morning to the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne this morning. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that we fail you so oft. Father, we acknowledge that we are weak. And Lord, without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, we acknowledge that you are the true and the only God and that we are your servants and we want to meet with you around your throne this morning. Lord, I'm so thankful that the blood of Jesus was shed for me. I'm so thankful, Lord, not just for me, but for every single person on this earth who has ever drawn a breath. Jesus has died for their sins. Lord, I'm so thankful that salvation is not, Lord, it's not some thing I have to climb up some high mountain to get. It's not something I have to dig deep for some uh, treasure that's buried. Lord, it's not something that's hard for me to come to. Lord, it's, it's free. It's a gift. Lord, I'm thankful that you've given me that gift. And Lord, I pray for the one out there listening to me this morning. Lord, that you'll show them, that you'll direct them to the truth. You'll help them, Father. The Holy Spirit will open their eyes, give them ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to respond. Oh, Lord, please, help me to preach. Lord, I, wanna, I know this is important stuff, Father. I know this is an important message. I pray, Father, that you'd forgive my sin and cleanse me and fill me with the Holy Spirit of God, Lord. I pray your touch be upon me today. Pray, Lord, that you use me today, Lord. I just want to give you glory with my life. Lord, I just pray that, Father, someone would receive the message today, receive Jesus and be born again. That's my prayer. That's my hope, Lord. I pray for, Lord, backslidden Christians, Lord, to be smitten by the Holy Spirit and come in rededication and renewal. Lord, to, re to begin to live for you again as they ought to. Father, I pray, Lord, please help now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all that I read, I want to focus primarily on verse 24. There's a lot in this we can talk about, but I really believe the, the central message is verse 24. And Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. That's, that's a scary thought, a very scary thought. But folks, I'll, before we look at the scariness of that, because I don't think that's the first place we need to go, I think we need to look at it and see what he's talking about. What is the straight gate? Now, first of all, I just want to say that, that when he says strive to enter in at the straight gate, he's talking about a narrow gate. The Bible says over in Matthew, I believe it is, where he says straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. It's a narrow gate. It's a straight gate. It's a low gate. It's one that someone has to come in a certain way. It's not a broad gate. Everybody can't get in it because it requires a lowering of yourself. But before we get into all that, let's look at the goodness of this gate. Amen? I want you to see that Jesus is talking about himself. He, when he speaks of that straight gate, he, is, he said, I am the door of the sheepfold. That is the straight gate. That is the narrow way. It is Jesus. He is the door of the sheepfold. I want you to see that this gate is not a gate to be 
despised or a gate to be looked over. No, it's far from that. Uh, the contrary, it's a desirable gate. It's a gate that we ought to desire to enter into. I want to talk to you this morning, sinner friend. I want you to understand something. Regardless of what the world has told you about Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. I want you to know, in spite of everything you've heard, that his way is not a hard way. His way is a, it's an easy way because he has made the hard part easy because he's done the hard part for you. I dare say if you went to any, any other religion in this world and asked them, what must I do to have eternal life? Oh, they'd begin to give you a list of all kinds of requirements and do's and don'ts. And, 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 and folks, it's something that we could never, ever, ever attain to get rid of our sins because there is nothing we can do. I remember standing in a restaurant many years ago, and there was a man who came up and, and was introduced to me, and he had this red string tied around his, his wrist. And uh, you may not remember what that was all about, but that was a symbol of if you were practicing Kabbalah, which is uh, basically Jewish witchcraft. And uh, and this man was introduced to me by by a woman who owned a rest, restaurant, and she said, "This I want you to introduce you to my friend. Uh, this is this is Brandon Teague. He's a pastor here in town. And, and, and I shook the man's hand, and when I shook his hand, I noticed the red string. And I don't remember how the conversation transpired, but we got to the point of, uh, of, of we got into a discussion about what he believed. And uh, he, he tried to tell me that what he believed and what I believed were very similar. I said, well, let me ask you a question. What do y'all do with sin? And he stood there a minute and he said, well, we, we have some meditations and things that we do to get it to go away. Let me tell you something. You can't meditate your sins away. You can't sing your sins away. You can't good yourself. You can't do good. To do. Listen, there is not a good deed that I've ever done that has erased a bad deed that I've ever done. They are still there. And when you come to the end of your life, every deed you've ever done, it makes no difference whether they were good or whether they were bad. What you consider good, God looks at and says, those are filthy rags. There's nothing you've ever done that God needed to begin with. God wants you. He's not interested in your works. It's a desirable gate. So, so why is this gate a gate to enter? Let's look at that for a minute. Well, first of all, <clears throat> this gate is a gate that's desirable to enter because it is a gate to the city of refuge. Now, let me just let me get you to turn over to Numbers chapter thirty-five, if you would, for me. Numbers, right before Deuteronomy, right after Leviticus. Numbers chapter thirty-five. Chapter 35, verses 11 and 12. Numbers 35, verses 11 and 12. I said it's a city of refuge. It's a place where a person could could hide. And why are they hiding? Well, because sometimes in the course of life, thing, uh, there are accidents that happen. And there is a legal um, term called manslaughter. In other words, where an accident occurs and someone is killed, and it was not intentional, but yet the person died. And at times when something like that happens, a family member will say, well, you know what, I'm going to get that guy. I'm going to get him because he killed my brother, regardless of whether it was, whether it was intentional or not. Um, so let's look in the Bible here. God God made a way for somebody who was guilty of something, yet he gave them a way to uh, escape it. And I want to show you something for, uh, for a while. Now listen. Then you shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. Okay, that's accidentally. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So I'm comparing heaven to this. God gave, God put this there for, again, somebody. They didn't mean to do it, it was, but they still had done it nonetheless. Uh, but God gave them a place to run to so that they would be safe 
from the one who was seeking to kill him. And I want you to know something. All of us are guilty. There's not a one of us alive on this earth who are not guilty of sin. We have wronged God. But God in his wrath has given us a way to escape his wrath. God, God's wrath is there. God's wrath doesn't, doesn't go away. But God, I said God in his wrath, but God in his mercy gave us a way to escape his wrath. He has give, given us a city of refuge. And what is that? That gate is Jesus. When we come to Jesus and we believe on Christ, as our Savior, there is an escape from the penalty that hung over our head, which is death for our sin, death and punishment in hell forevermore. In that lake of fire, there is the punishment. But God says until they can be judged, well, listen to me. If I come to Jesus and I believe on Christ and I become a believer, my judgment is placed on Christ. And Christ took that at Calvary. It was already done and already over with. The case is settled. And if I believe on him, there's refuge for me. And I don't have to be afraid of, of being cast into hell because Jesus has paid the price. Hebrews chapter 6. I'll turn over there and read you that. Hebrews chapter 6. be a lot of turning back and forth this morning. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. The Bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. You see that? We have fled for refuge. Where do we flee to? To God. We flee, fled to God through Christ. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. The only way to come to God is through Christ. And I know I'm just... I'm just touching on it. You want to go back and look at it for yourself. There's a whole lot more there. But I want you to see that, that God has given us a way to go, a refuge, to lay hold amen, upon the hopes that before us. In Christ, we have hope and we have a place of refuge. And he is the gate to that refuge. Amen? Why is it a, why is it a gate to go through? Because, listen, it's the gate of home. It's the gate to home. Jesus over in John chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There is a gate there that leads to home. Home, a place of rest to the soul where we'll never, ever, ever be alone again. We'll never, ever be apart from God again. We'll never, ever, ever know sin again. We'll never know shame or guilt. There'll be peace forevermore. Everything will be right. Everything will be like it should be. It'll be better. The Bible tells us that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So God, it's home waiting on us. Listen, I'm not going to some grave in a cemetery. I don't remember who I was riding in the vehicle with. It was either my wife or one of my sons, and we were talking about, we drove past the cemetery. I don't can't remember who it was we were having a conversation with, but but somebody asked me, so are you be buried are you gonna be buried out there? And I really don't know where I'm gonna be buried, to be honest with you. But you know what? I hope I'm not buried. I hope I hope I don't have to be buried. I'm counting on Jesus coming back. I'm counting on Jesus taking me out of here. But if I have to be buried, you know what? I'm not gonna worry about where I'm buried because it ain't gonna be me there anyway. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. Where, where, my, where my grandparents went. Amen? I know they're all there because I know they all knew Jesus. Every one of them. They're in heaven. Amen? I'm going to go home and see them. I've got a brother there that I'm going to see. My dad went there. I'm going to see him. Amen? I'm looking forward to going home someday. I just want everybody that I love to go with me. I don't want to leave any of them here. I don't want to leave any of them to miss home. 
And that's why I'm pleading with you. You say, well, you don't know me. I don't have to know you. God knows you. And I know that God doesn't love me any more than he loves you. He didn't love he didn't love David any more than he loves me. He didn't love Abraham any more than he loves me. He loves me not because of who I am. And he doesn't love you because of who you are. He loves me because I am washed in the blood of his dear son. He loves me because Jesus has covered me in his blood. My sins have been forgiven because Jesus died for me. Amen? And because of that, there's a home waiting on me. Why is it a desirable gate? Because it's a gate to the city of refuge. It's a gate to home. You know what also? It's a gate that leads to a wonderful feast. A wonderful feast. Revelation chapter 19 real quick, if you would. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 and verse 6, if you would. The Bible says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. John said, And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That means the all-powerful Lord God reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. You say, who is that wife? That's his church. That's all those who have believed on him and trusted him for salvation. And, and listen, that, that's all those washed in the blood. Amen. That's the wife. Amen. And the Bible says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's not because of my good deeds. That's not because of a good life I live. That's because of the blood of Jesus Christ that's been applied. It's my sins, and it's washed them away, and washed them white as snow. And the Bible said, And he, said unto, he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I've thought a lot about that marriage supper, and I've wondered a lot of times, well, what is God going to serve us? We're sitting down to eat with Jesus. This is a feast. This is a feast that's going to take place. Right around the time that we are going to be united with him forevermore, and we're going to come back on white horses to this world. And I know I'm getting into something I don't really need, need to fool with this morning. But I just want to say to you, this is going to take place in heaven. And the only way to get to this feast is to go through that gate. There's no other way you can come to it. It's the only way. So Jesus is going, listen to me. The Bible, listen, we're, we're going to sit down around, this, uh, around the table with Jesus in heaven. I can't, I can't imagine it. The Bible says that, that neither hath entered into the hearts of man. I, all I can do is, is imagine because I know God's told me enough to give me an, a, a, an imagination of it. But I just imagine in heaven that Jesus, uh, very much like at that last supper when he, when he washed their feet and he, he, pre he prepared them for the, the supper, I very much so I see Jesus when we get to heaven, Jesus sitting down. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna serve us. He's going to gird himself, which means he's going to tie his robe up and serve us. He's going he's gonna to serve us. And why would he serve us? He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Why would he serve me and, 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 and put food in front of me? Why would he do that for me? He's because he loves me and he wants me to be at home with him. Listen, I'm going to spend eternity with him. Not as some forgotten member of heaven that he sees once in a millennia. No. I'm going to be with him forever. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy the, the love of God forever in that home. And I'm going to a feast where I'm going to sit down with Jesus. And you know what? At that feast, sin won't ever enter my mind. At that feast, listen, the, the pains of earth will never again haunt my mind. The sin that I, that I endured in this life, 
it'll never come back to mind there. I'm going to be at peace at home with Jesus. Listen, it's the gate to paradise. A long, long, long time ago, Adam and Eve sinned, and they were cast out of the garden. And, and the Bible says that there were angels with flaming swords. Well, they couldn't go back in. They had to walk out into a barren desert land. They didn't have the lush garden and all that they ever needed. No, Adam had to work by the sweat of his face to eat bread, the Bible says. And, 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 and sorrow was upon the woman as she went through the pains of death to bear children. And, and all, the, all the things that, that weren't there before are there now. <clears throat> Ever since then, men have been looking for that garden. There's still people today trying to figure out where the Garden of Eden is. But I'm going to tell you something. They'll never find it. They'll never find it. Not on this earth. They can't go back in. God said so. But let me tell you something. When we go through that gate... We got an entrance back to paradise. God's going to make all things new. The Bible said he will. He'll make all things new. It'll be better than it ever was. Amen. That's the gate to paradise. Listen, it's a gate that we ought to desire to enter into. But you, you say, why, why, why else? Well, I'll tell you why else. Because of what will happen to those who are outside it. You know, it's kind of, I, I, this morning I was, I told my wife, I said, you know, it's amazing how God does things because Wednesday night we were out at Stillhouse Nursing Home in Paris and, and I preached on Psalm chapter 50. And and those verses tie right in with what we are talking about this morning. And I want to go back to... Uh, I want to go back to what God said there in, in Psalm chapter 50, beginning in six, uh, 16 and, and following down to verse 22 the bible says but unto the wicked those are those those are the ones who will be outside the gate who will not enter in they're wicked because they didn't they didn't want to enter in amen they didn't want what god had for them listen they're, they're wicked because they they're in sin and they've rejected god the bible says but unto the wicked god saith what hast thou to do to declare my statutes what are you doing trying to quote scripture? What are you doing trying to say what I have said and trying to use the Bible for your own means? Listen, there's so many false religions out there that like to quote Bible in error. There are so many that like to build lies out of twisting doctrine. Listen, there's so many. The Bible says, but what he said, God says, what are you doing trying to declare my statutes? You don't, you don't even know what you're saying or that thou should take my covenant into thy mouth. There's so many wicked teachers. There are so many wicked uh, liars out there who, who proclaim to be representing our Lord, but yet they know nothing of him. They are wicked. Listen, they're <clears throat> just the other day, I saw a collection of religious leaders who were rallying behind Planned Parenthood and saying that it was the work of God to abort babies, to kill babies. Now listen, if that doesn't fulfill the scripture, I don't know what does because they're standing there proclaiming that they're doing the work of God and they're doing the absolute opposite. He said, how dare you take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. They say, oh, we don't, we don't need that Bible. I know, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. We're all God's children. They can say anything they want to. He said, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him. You saw that thief and said, oh, yeah, that's all right. We can make money that way. There's a lot of people in our government that are they're thieves. They're people who claim to be, they're, they're claimed to be representing God in every Sunday they come on the television set, and they, they, they got there in their Learjet, and they rode there in their limousine, and they wear their thousands of dollars of suits, and, 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 and they have their gold furniture, and, oh, they're impressive. And they come out with kind, flattering words, and they claim to, they claim to know God. But you know what? If you don't send them the money that they say you need to send them, you won't get the blessings of God. They're thieves. Thieves. 
and robbers. And God says, Thou consentest with him and hast become a partaker with adulterers. God's, God's word's not holy to them. They live however they want to, and they claim to know him. Thou givest thy mouth to evil. It's not a problem for them to speak evil things. And thy tongue framest deceit. They lie. He said, Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother and slanderest thine own mother's son. You'll turn on each other. You'll stab each other in the back. These things hast thou done, God said, and I kept silence. Didn't say anything. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. You thought I was just like you. Thought God's okay with me. He said, but I will reprove thee. He's going to rebuke them and set them in order before thine eyes. God is going to deal with the wicked who has claimed to have known God. The Bible says over in Romans chapter 1, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God's going to deal with them. He says in verse 22, listen, now consider this. Ye that forget God lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. What's going to happen to those outside the gate? That's who he's talking to. God says, I'm going to tear you in pieces. Oh, you know, I, I just happen to think, God talks about that again over in, in Proverbs. Um, he tells them, he says, turn you at my reproof. I'm in chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. God's word has gone throughout this world. The known world has heard the gospel. The world has, has heard it, but they didn't want it. He said, because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, but no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. And when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, like a tornado bearing down on you, stress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. God says, woe unto them that are outside the gate. Again, Jesus is the gate. Again, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, the Son. So, you know, the Bible does say that there's a group of people there who are going to seek to enter but won't be able to enter. It says it right there in, in verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. That puts chills down my spine. But see, I want you to understand there's a difference. Notice he says, strive to enter in. Strive. There's a difference between seeking and striving. Well, we're looking. We're trying to find it. We're going to look around. We're going to look at, we're going to look at Catholicism. And, 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 and I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to look at Hinduism. I'm going to look at uh, Mormonism. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to check everything out and find out what's real, what's right. And they're seeking. Those are seeking. There are people, listen, there are people down at some of these places of worship that pervert the gospel. And, 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 and I mean, they tell you, you've got, oh, yeah, it's okay to believe on Jesus, but you have to do this and this and this, and don't do this or this, and then you can be saved. Can I tell you something? They're seeking, but they're not striving. There's a difference. There's a difference. Because, you see, there's only one way to come in. Only one way. You ain't going to find, you may look and look and look and look, but you'll never find another way. They're seeking. They're seeking. They're seeking to enter in, not necessarily at the straight gate, but they're seeking to enter in. They want to get to God, but they don't want to come his way. And why won't they come in that gate? 
It could be because of their proud, their proud, because of their pride, because they don't want to uh, to to own up to the fact that that we are sinners before God. The Bible says, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God." We, I, there's no way that any of us ever, on our best day, in our best moment, in our absolute. Red letter day, perfect day that we've ever measured up to God's glory and his perfection. Let's be honest. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. For all have sinned. We didn't sin against each other. You would say, well, I've been ugly to my wife. Yeah, you may have been ugly to her, but you didn't sin against your wife. You sinned against God. It may have hurt your wife, but you sinned against God. Because when you die, listen to me, you're not going to answer to your wife. You're going to answer to God. And it takes humbling, humility to come in that gate, that straight gate, that narrow gate. It's a low gate. It takes a, a kneeling to come in that gate. You see... The Bible tells us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift us up. We have to come in on our knees. We have to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and say to him, Lord, I'm a worthless sinner. I need need to be forgiven. I I need to be washed new. I need to be made new. I realize and I understand that you died for me and that your blood was shed, that you are the Lamb of God, that you are the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb, and your blood is the only thing that will wash filthy sins of mine away and make me just, justified. That word means just as if I had never sinned, justified before God. Justice has been done because it was all placed upon Jesus on Calvary. You know, Calvary is an interesting word. You know, in all these phony Bibles, they don't even mention that word. Not even in the, I'm not even in these modern perversions. Golgotha's in there, but Calvary's not. Can you imagine singing, Years I spent in vanity and pride, Caring not my Lord was crucified, Knowing not it was for me he died on Golgotha. Isn't that lovely? Calvary, where he died for me. Amen? On a hill called Calvary, he hung there, bearing my sin and suffering immeasurably. And because of that, it humbles me to know that I had to come to him and receive that gift of salvation that he died for me and he paid for. And he did it because he loved me. What a great love he loved me with. Nobody's ever loved me like that. Nowhere, ever. That love goes beyond my understanding, my comprehension. It blows my little old mind that God loved me like that. If you're proud and you're full of yourself and you're swollen, you can't see that. You look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a self-made man or I'm an independent woman. I can do whatever I want to do. This is my life and it's my world and I'll do what I want to. And there's so many who are filled with that lie and that's the opposite of what God tells us. That's satanic. It's evil. Diabolical to think that this is your world and you made it. You'll die and your memory will be forgotten. You'll just be a rock out in the cemetery with, with a name on it. Oh, everybody will walk by and say, wonder who they were, but God still knows who you are, and God will see you in hell suffering. And you won't be there unjustly. You'll be there on purpose because you rejected the way in, because you wouldn't come in that straight gate. You were seeking, oh, I'm trying to find a way to God. But you weren't striving. You weren't striving to come in the right way. Listen to me. Why are we striving? Because there are so many voices out there that tell us the opposite. There are so many ways offered to us in this life, supposedly ways to come to God or ways to get to where where we think we want to go when we die. Uh, the, The Buddhists say, well, you'll get to nirvana. It's a place of peace and everything is perfect. There is no nirvana. The Muslims are said, you know, you do this and this. You go to a place and there'll be 72 virgins waiting upon you. Yeah. 
There is no Allah. Muhammad was a pervert. And you won't go there wait on those 72 virgins waiting on you. I promise you that. You'll split hell wide open and your screams will, will ring throughout hell's chambers forever. Why won't there be people that will enter in? Why will they stand outside seeking and not be able to come in? Because they wouldn't lay their idols down. Listen to me. That, that's why we're a sinner, because we cling to the idols of this world. We cling, Listen, the Bible tells us that, that, that the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That desire to, to be what we can be and do what we can do and have what we can have. Listen, if it goes against God's will and we don't care, it's an idol. Listen to me. God, God doesn't save you in your sin. Listen, Jesus doesn't save an alcoholic so he can be a saved alcoholic. Do you understand that? God doesn't save an adulterer so he can be a born-again adulterer. God doesn't save a sinner so they can just go on and live in sin Oh, well, I got my punch, my ticket punched to heaven. I'm good now. I'll just do whatever I want to do. No. Can I say something to you this morning? Sin is grievous to a believer. Because, listen, I'm not saying to you, and I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying to you that once you have received Christ and became a born-again child of God, that this body will never want to sin again. Because this flesh will always want to sin. But let me tell you something. You'll never look at sin the same way again if you're in Christ. You may, you may do it. You may wander from God and you may sin. And, you, and we'll sin, I'm saying. But you may, you may grievously sin. But when you do, you will not enjoy it. You will grieve, be grieved over it. And you'll know that God is grieved over it. You'll never enjoy yourself again in your sin if you're a child of God. Christ saves from sin. Christ saves us to live for him. Christ dies for us so that he might be the power in us. Hebrews chapter 12, let me read it to you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. For consider him, that's Christ, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. I want you to think just for a second of Christ hanging on Calvary's tree, flesh hanging in ribbons, bleeding profusely, nailed to that wooden cross, fighting for every breath in agony, dying for you and I. And then consider us and how hard we fight not to sin. Consider, consider those standing at the foot of the cross, the contradiction between him and them he died for. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds and say, oh, this is too hard. This is too hard of a Christian life. He said, ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Nobody's went as far as to... To, to, to shed blood trying not to sin is what he said. He, listen, he said, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Don't get upset when God reaches and snatches a knot in you. That's the way my daddy used to put it. I'm going to snatch a knot in you. I'm going to tear you up. Listen to me, God is going to whoop you if you're his child. Because you know what? You're going to be disobedient from time to time and, and be hard-headed and go the wrong direction. And God is going to have to come and get you. And he's going to have to spank your hind end. You say, how in the world does God do that? He does it in all different kinds of ways. But he will get your attention. Uh, let, me say, let me say to you, if you are born again, if you have been saved, if you're listening to me this morning, and you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been spanked by God before. God has dealt with you. 
circumstances in your life happen that wouldn't have happened if God wasn't trying to get a hold of you. God will yank the rug out from under you. It's happened to me many times. I hate to say it, but it has. God trying to get me to listen. God trying to get me to see. He says, despise not. Don't get mad when God spanks you. Despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Don't quit just because God gets on to you. Don't get mad and say, well, I'm through trying to serve God. He's mean to me. He said, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Listen, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. The Bible tells us that. Listen, the Bible tells us that that that, that, a, that a father, uh, the father, he, he spanks his child if he loves him. He hates his child if he doesn't. God loves us. If you are a born-again believer, God has worn you out before. And he said, if you endure chastening, and that word chastening again is whooping, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Listen, if, you, if you're a child and your daddy ain't never got on to you, you're not really, he ain't much of a daddy, is he? He said, but if you be without chastisement, if you've never been in trouble with God and God ain't never dealt with you, he said, whereof all are partakers, every child of God has been dealt with. He said, then are ye bastards and not sons. What does that word bastards mean? We look at it now, oh, bastards are terrible words, ugly cuss words. But it's not truly. It means you don't know who your daddy is. A bastard child is one who the daddy is not known. He's saying, you're, God's saying, I'm not your father if I ain't ever had to get a hold of you. There's a whole group of people outside the gate who God ain't never dealt with. They just they have no problem going on in their sins and being happy in their sins because God's not dealing with them. Holy Spirit of God doesn't prick their heart about it. Listen, once you're saved, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. God's in there. You can't just go on and live how you want to live without God saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're failing me, you're wrong. God's going to show you. God's going to remind you what the Bible says. Somebody, listen to me, David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, and God didn't let him go and do what he wanted to do. No, he sent Nathan the prophet to him, and he told him a story that broke David's heart. And David said, the man that did this to this little lamb, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, he's he going to repay fourfold. And Nathan looked at him and said, thou art the man. And God did. Four times in his children's life, they suffered, and it broke David's heart in pieces. He was scourged by God for what he did. Don't blink for one second. God doesn't deal with his children. The Bible says God, David was a man after God's own heart. But yet God had to deal with him harshly. Why? Because he was his child and he loved him. And he loves you if you're his child. And listen, if you want to avoid all that, come back to him. Quit running from him. Learn to love him like you should. Build a relationship with him that you maybe have avoided or been lazy about. Some people want to wait. They say, well, you know, someday, someday when I get through living and partying, I'll get saved. I'll live for Jesus then. There have been a many who waited to their deathbed. And in their hour of dying, they call for a preacher. Please help me. I'm dying. Please tell me what I got to do. Can I tell you something? I don't think many of those folks get saved. I really don't. Not much a preacher can do at that point. And the reason I say I don't believe many of those folks get saved is because of this. You don't come to God when you feel like it's time. You don't make that hour up. You don't decide. You don't make the appointment with God and say, God, you know, I'm going to deal with you when I'm ready to. No. The Spirit of God is the one who comes to us. The Spirit of God is the one who, who draws us under conviction of God and gives us space to repent. We've all been given space to repent. There's a beginning to that and there's an end to that. And if we miss the end of that, God may never deal with us again. And all the words that you could cry out, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe, I believe. 
it ain't going to do anything at that point. Because if God's not dealing with you, you're not going to be saved. You're just seeking. You're feeling along the wall, trying to find a way in, but it's too late. I'm not saying no one ever gets saved on their deathbed. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying God, it doesn't seem like God would wait that long. You may say, well, what about the thief on the cross? I don't know about the thief on the cross, but I know Jesus was there. I don't know his life story. I have no idea. Maybe that was the first time he'd ever heard the gospel. Maybe that was the first time he'd ever been around Jesus Christ and realized that he was the Savior. I can't speak for him, but I can say to you, don't wait. If God is seeking, strive, striving with you about your soul today, if God is dealing with you about your sins, do not, do not wait. Don't put it off one second. There's more for you than you could ever imagine in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you something? There will be some even after they die who are still trying to get in. They can't get in. You say, where do you find that at in the Bible? Look in verse 25. Look at verse 25 in Luke chapter 13. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not, I know you not when ye are. And then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not when ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and ye yourselves thrust out. The only way these people he's speaking to could ever see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is in the afterlife when they're still trying to get in. They're still saying, well, Jesus, you were there in Jerusalem, and we heard you preach, and we, we were there, and you were, you were eating and drinking here and there, and we heard you, and we, we, know, we know now. It's too late. It's too late. Don't wait too late. Don't wait, because there'll be no way then. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Listen to me. Jesus Christ took your place. You should have been on that cross. You should have been the one that they were jeering at and mocking and, and spitting on and beating and nailing to a cross. That should have been me. That should have been you. But Christ took our sin. He took our sin and he became sin for us. God put the sin of the entire world, all of the horrible things that you've done that nobody even knows about, the things that you wish could be erased from your memory, all of those things God put on Jesus Christ. Not just you and me. He put Charlie Manson's sins on Jesus. He put Osama bin Laden's sins on Jesus. He put, he put all of the wicked people that have ever lived in this world, all of their sins were placed on Jesus. You see, everybody's wicked. Everybody, all of us, all of us are wicked. The Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. All of our sin was put on Jesus, and Jesus took all of it, and he bore it all. Jesus took our shame. Christ took our shame to Calvary. He was crucified. You, you know, you see these little images, and God tells us not to, uh, to, to carve an image of Jesus. It's wicked to do that, a picture or an image, a carved image. But they put a little loincloth on, on Jesus and a little tiny little cut in his side, a little trickle of blood, little red spots in his hand, a little red spot on his feet. That's not the way it looked. Jesus was naked, completely naked on that cross. He didn't have a thing on to cover him. He bore the shame, the Bible says. The reason he did that is because we have so much to be ashamed of. 
And Jesus bore our shame on Calvary. Christ took our punishment. God will never hold up one of your sins if you're a child of God and say, I'm going to put you in hell for this because all of the punishment was taken by Jesus. All that he did, all that he went through, he doesn't charge us a penny. He comes to you this morning and he offers you salvation from your sin. He offers you a city of refuge. He offers you home. He offers you a feast. He offers you paradise. He offers you eternal life. Don't keep feeling along the wall for another way in. There is no other way. Humble yourself. Get on your knees. Realize there is no other way. Repent. Repent. It means acknowledge that you're wrong and he's right. It means it means come to the understanding that your sin is going to put you in hell. Turn around, drop your idols and come and kneel at his feet. Bow before him. Receive his grace. His grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God gives you everything he's promised to his son. At his, at his expense, and he paid for it. That's how much he loves you. Receive his salvation. Receive his forgiveness. Receive everything that the Father has for you. He says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. I wouldn't listen to me. I Strive. If your friends are why you won't come to Jesus, I would fight everything in me to turn from those friends and say, I'm not going to go to hell for you. I remember hearing a story years ago, and I don't know who it was, and I don't know where it was, but I heard a preacher tell the story of a revival meeting being held in a country church somewhere. At the end of the invitation, the, the invitation was given the last night of the revival meeting, and a call for salvation was given, and out stepped the preacher's wife, and she walked down the aisle toward the front. And as she got to where the altar was, her husband stood stood over at the side and the evangelist stood down front and she looked at her husband and she spoke these words. She said, I'm not going to hell for you or anybody. And what did she mean? She meant, I don't care if this rocks this church to its core and you lose your job, I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to let it stand in my way. I'm not going to let the humil I'm not going to let the pride of being the pastor's wife Keep me from coming to Jesus and making it public and letting the world know that I've been born again. I remember on a Wednesday night in a college that I attended when the president of the Bible college got born again. He said, how in the world does a man get to that position and be lost? Same way anybody can do. They pretend. That night, conviction hit him and he got born again. I'm going to say to you this, this morning, I don't care where you are in life. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what you've done, what you've told people. It does not matter. All that matters is what about your eternal soul. It's going to be somewhere for eternity. Enter in. Strive. Nothing in this world is worth going to hell for. Nothing. Turn around. Come to Jesus. Get born again. Father, help us this morning. Lord, I plead with you for the one who's lost. I plead with you. Holy Spirit, I remember conviction. I remember it well. I remember the, the, the mortal terror that went through me, realizing that I was hanging over hell. Oh, Lord, I pray for that one who's right now in the place of decision. Oh, Lord, give them the power of the Holy Ghost that they might see Jesus in all his glory. I pray that you'd enlighten their mind that they, and their heart and their eyes that they might see him and they might realize that he's done everything for them. Oh, Lord, that they might see him in all his glory and beauty and that they might come to him for salvation. Oh, Lord, I plead with them.
please, Father, draw them to Jesus. Draw them to Calvary. Lord, give them salvation. Let them believe on you through faith in Jesus and nothing more. Lord, I plead with you now for the one who's who's been saved for for some time and they've gotten cold in their heart. Renew to them again the joy of being saved. Restore unto them the love that they once had that once beat in their heart toward you. Lord, I pray, Father, that everything be removed out of the way, Lord, so the fellowship can, can begin afresh again. Lord God, I just thank you now. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for being so forgiving and kind. Lord, we thank you for Jesus today. My prayer is, Lord, that wherever they may be this morning, that they've found the answer they're looking for. Lord, please bless. In Jesus' name, amen.